So go ahead when you're ready, Malcolm. Uh, I begin by noting the extremely sad news of the passing last week of Professor George Huxley, uh, a giant of Virginian prehistory. I always made a point of submitting drafts of my papers to George and invariably received back detailed, extremely incisive, and often amusing corrections and suggestions. I would like to dedicate this paper to his memory. I'm especially grateful to Charlotte Pearson for much good counsel, information, and advice. I thank as well Manfred Betok, Richard Darwin, Peter Cunahom, Floyd McCoy, Thomas Palima, and Peter Warren for insightful comments, and Aaron Hayes, Jason Earl, and Rebecca Hahn for critical research assistance. I begin with the checkered history of radiocarbon dating. In 1960, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to Professor Willard Libby uh, for his method to use radiocarbon 14 age for age determination in archaeology, geology, geophysics, and other branches of science. In 1979, at the time of the centenary of the founding of the Archaeological Institute of America, Professor Libby received the Centennial Award of the AIA to celebrate his achievement. During the event, I asked Professor Libby if he was troubled by the questions and criticisms that appeared about it, that had appeared about his work. Professor Libby replied that he had been sufficiently concerned to investigate whether there existed any provisions for rescinding a Nobel Prize once it had been bestowed and was relieved to learn that there, was, that there were not a disarming display of modesty. Then came what has been called the second radiocarbon revolution, the creation of the calibration curve. Certain species of trees grow to extremely old ages and generally show annual rings, which can be counted. By obtaining the radiocarbon measurement from a ring or a series of rings of known calendar date, a method of improving the accuracy of a given radiocarbon date based on mathematical half-life calculations was created through the process of calibration against annual tree rings of known date. Oaks from the Rhine River Valley were selected for this purpose, along with oak trees from Ireland measured at the Belfast Lab. Because it was then far too expensive to make annual measurements, or even to replicate measurements for the most part, it was decided to measure first 20 and then 10 year segments with little replication. Each decision had fateful consequences. As a distinguished pioneer in radiocarbon studies, Professor Minza Stiver, the director of the former laboratory of the University of Washington in Seattle was quick to note 10-year segments were particularly problematic because of the 11-year sunspot cycle, which was known to impact radiocarbon dates. Of course, radiocarbon measurement itself was problematic since different laboratories using varying preparation and measurement methods could obtain different results for samples of the tree, same tree ring years if split and divided between them. An unpleasant underlying reality of radiocarbon dating that is still troublesome today. In recent interlab comparisons, about half of the 16 participating laboratories produced results for a sample divided between them, which were consistent within plus or minus 10 years. The rest shows offsets of between 20 and 30 years. However, the fact that several laboratories produced roughly consistent measurements does not in itself indicate that the date ranges obtained are correct. For all radiocarbon measurements are subject to first, oscillating calibration curves in certain time segments, and second, both terrestrial and maritime reservoir effects in some geographic areas, sometimes of major dimensions, which push radiocarbon measurements to incorrectly older dates. All measurements have a Varying degrees of analytical accuracy is conveyed by stated errors and can have a considerable impact on calibration. The NCAL 13 calibration curve on which much published information or misinformation was based showed twin peaks 
around 1610 and 1530 BCE for the late Bronze Age shade of the famous eruption of the Theron volcano, as you see on the chart. For a detailed account of the checkered history of radiocarbon data the dating to the present, see Paula Reimer's article of 2022. The revised NCAL 20 calibration curve is based on radiocarbon measurements of annual rather than decadal tree ring segments between 1700 and 1500 BC. The task was initiated at the University of Arizona Laboratory of Tree Ring Research by a team led by Associate Professor Charlotte Pearson and was independently confirmed by the Zurich and Mannheim Laboratories. The new calibration curve accepted by the NCAL Working Group, composed of leading radiocarbon researchers from the major radiocarbon laboratories, recalculates the radiocarbon date range for seed samples from the Theron eruption context to between 1570 and 1510 BCE. On radiocarbon measurement grounds alone, apart from the direct pre-ring Egyptian and Cypriot interconnections, and the Theron pumice evidence considered below, the lower decades of the range are more likely to include the true date of the eruption because of the established presence of both terrestrial and marine reservoir effects on Thera. Terrestrial reservoir effects refer to emissions of old carbon from the Earth's surface, which push radiocarbon measurements backward in time. Do we have the next slide now? For example, Italy as a whole, even apart from the famous volcanoes at Vesuvius, Strambo uh, Stromboli, and Etna, contain, contains massive gas emission fields, which stretch from the Alps to most of Sicily, producing radiocarbon dates for historically known contexts that are often much too early. On Thera itself, the situation is also clear. Terrestrial radiocarbon effects stem from the volcanic nature of the island. Bruns et al. collected living samples whose true age was zero from locations around Paleocomini Island in the center of the Theron Caldera in the late 1970s and found that many produced radiocarbon measurements hundreds of years old, though their true age was zero. Further, non-volcanic earthquakes often trigger the release of carbon-14 depleted gas from vents or fumaroles. Earthquakes are, of course, frequent on Thera. 109 earthquakes, most with a Richter magnitude of 1 to 3, were reported in a four-year period between 1985 and 1988. The most recent radiocarbon dating evidence for the Theron eruption from an off-island context also points to more recent dating. Thera is also subject to marine reservoir effects. Radiocarbon measurements of short lived mollusks often produce ages more than 400 years older than the actual age due to the presence of deep water, a known reservoir of old carbon. An average Mediterranean offset of 458 plus or minus 85 years was proposed in a study by Reimer and McCormick. Moreover, five kilometers to the northeast of Thera, a major underwater source of, of carbon-14 depleted, depleted carbon exists at the Colombo Bank. Colombo degasses bubbles of nearly pure CO2 and is the largest in a chain of about 20 underwater volcanic craters. Professor Floyd McCoy, a preeminent volcanologist, described the Colombo Bank as a, quote, a very dangerous volcano perhaps the most dangerous in the South Aegean today, about whose eruptive history little is known. Lastly, Thera lies enveloped in fog many days of the year, providing an obvious means of transmission of marine carbon-14 depleted carbon, a phenomenon also seen in Japan where it is called the island effect. In sum, there are many sources of reservoir effects on and around Thera any of all of which produce erroneously high radiocarbon ages from affected samples. Accordingly, the lower end of the radiocarbon range of dates for the Theron eruption of 1570 to 1510 
is indicated by the radiocarbon evidence itself, apart from other compelling evidence considered below. Charlotte Pearson has noted that because the Theron eruption sits right on a radiocarbon plateau, it is impossible to confirm a date for Thera with the current radiocarbon evidence, and therefore other evidence, other methods must be used. Let us now turn to the compelling evidence other than radiocarbon dating for the date of the Theron eruption. First, consider the evidence from Egyptian and Cypriot interconnections. Egyptian stone vases of a type undocumented before the Egyptian 18th dynasty appear with late Hellatic I material, coterminous with the end of late Minoan 1A, Theron destruction level, in the shaft graves of Mycenae. One of these had been reworked into a Minoan-shaped stone vessel en route, likely in Crete as, long, as noted long ago by Peter Warren. A typical Cypriot white slip one bowl and not of the earliest white slip one variety was present in the volcanic destruction level of Thera. The bowl had been used, broken and repaired between the earliest appearance of this variety of white slip one and the eruption. At Tel El Daba in Egypt, white slip one does not appear until the earliest New Kingdom levels, not before 1540 BCE at the earliest, whereas the prior Hyksos level contained the earliest proto white slipware. In Egyptian, Egyptian, in addition, Egyptian imitations of calcite alabaster base ring one juglets do not appear in secure contexts before Tutmosis III which would make 1525 BC seem the earliest possible date among those considered for the Theron eruption. Moreover, the recorded biographies of numbers of Egyptian officials leave little room for an extension of dates. The analysis of Peter Warren in this regard is compelling. He describes the careers of eight leading Egyptian officials who list in tomb inscriptions their years of service under successive pharaohs beginning in their 20s and including lists of service of 60 plus, 50 plus, or 40 plus years total. It is impossible to stretch their years of service much, if at all, unless they continue to serve until they reach the age of 100 or more. Accordingly, it is impossible to, le to lengthen Egyptian pharaonic reigns, uh, reign lengths by any significant amount. We turn now to compelling scientific evidence for the date of the Theron eruption. First, consider the pumice evidence. Theron pumice has been found and used at 19 separate Bronze Age archaeological sites in Egypt and the Levant, but never before Tutmosis levels. There are 30 samples from earlier strata, but 29 of these have been traced to known earlier eruptions of Niseros or Gali in the Dodecanese, and one floated, or perhaps was traded, all the way from an earlier eruption of Etna in Italy. Pumice had 12 significant known uses in antiquity and was particularly useful for metallurgy. Moreover, moreover Theron pumice is of high quality, and one piece was still in use in the Hellenistic period. It is highly unlikely that Theron pumice, if available earlier than the Tutmosis period, would not have been used. Finally, we arrive at the concluding and compelling direct tree ring evidence of volcanic eruptions. Tree rings at various locations in indicate damage in 1560 BCE, 1546 to 1544 BCE, and 1525 to 24 BCE. 1525 BCE damage appears in trees in China northern Russia, and in the mountains on the California-Nevada border, where the two years 1525 and 1524 BC are affected. Only if the accession of Tutmosis III were raised from the widely accepted Egyptological dates of uh, 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 1479 BC to 1490 BC or 1493 BC as proposed by Austin. Would 1544 BCE be possible at the margin for the Theron eruption? 
1560 BCE would require a major lengthening of early New Kingdom reigns. But as noted above, the lives of five senior Egyptian officials who served under successive pharaohs for 50 to 60 years, as shown by interconnected written records, would have to be extended to unreasonable lengths of 70 to 80 years to accommodate a date of 1544 BC or any decade, even a decade earlier than 1525 BC and exclude a date of 1560 BCE. The Theron eruption, like the Tambora eruption of 1815 CE, was a volcanic explosive set, explosivity index seven eruption, hence one of the most explosive in all history. Tambora and the Indonesian archipelago erupted between April and July of 1815 CE, killing an estimated 71,000 people with the explosion heard thousands of miles away. The following year, 1816, became known as the year without a summer because of the dramatic colder than normal summer temperatures, including some snowfall in parts of the United States and throughout much of Europe. Yet Tambora was a tropical eruption at 8.25 degrees south latitude with potential to impact climate systems and therefore tree ring both and a tree ring growth in both the northern and southern hemispheres. The impact of eruptions at more northerly latitude of Thera are less well understood currently, but uh, Thera's impact on climate would clearly be expected to appear in the northern hemisphere. Apart from the major event evident at 1525 BCE, however, no such event is observable on northern hemisphere trees. A comparable scenario to the Tambora eruption through the Volcanic Explosivity Index 7 Theron eruption would explain the indications of climate damage in California and Nevada tree rings at both 1525 and 1524 BC, as well as trees in China and Northern Siberia. The archeological dendrochronological and volcanological evidence all point to a massive, Theron, a massive eruption of Thera in 1525 BC. Lastly, we should know that a, a recently a new element has been added to the debate about the date of the Theron eruption via the work done by Charlotte Pearson of the University of Arizona Laboratory of Pre-Ray Research and her colleagues at the University of Bern and Swansea University studying the presence of sulfates in the ice core record. They have identified the source of the 1628 BC eruption reflected in the ice cores as the Antiochic volcano in Alaska. Unfortunately, no evidence for the period 1524 BC is available in the incompletely preserved ice cores. The question arises as to whether an eruption of the enormous magnitude of Thera could itself have caused a break in the ice core record. In addition, the coring me mechanisms encountered mechanical problems. On the GISP-2 core, there are some 60 odd breaks above the purported Thera layer an entire and an entire century. Uh, the sixth century of the common era was ground up altogether. Further, while the magna mass from the Thera eruption was certainly high, the sulfur content was quite low. An additional possible explanation for the lack to date of evidence of sulfate in ice cores near the 15 near the year 1525 BCE. It is also possible that the transport pathway of the aerosols and tephra from the Theron eruption was unfavorable to Greenland disposition and accordingly did not result in a large peak such as those investigated to date. I am grateful to Peter Abbott of the University of Bern for this suggestion and, Charlotte, and to Charlotte Pearson for her observation that this is a very important point. Uh, and something we are currently learning more about. The volcanic explosive, explosivity index five eruption of Vesuvius in, in 79 CE also left no indication in the Greenland ice cores. All scientific and archeological evidence considered the most likely date for the Theron eruption by far 
1525 BCE. Thank you. Now what do I do? Do I do something? Malcolm, you can read it because we didn't. Uh, Malcolm, thank you very, very much for um, a great, concise uh, summary and up to date summary of uh, much of the evidence. I think you've been just about the most persistent um, examiner. I'm going to come to the other microphone. Hello, can you hear me now, Malcolm? Yes, I can. Right, right. Sorry, I was just saying, um, you must, I think you're the most persistent of researchers in terms of seeking the truth about the um, date of the eruption of Thera, and you have kept us all on our toes um, for, for a very long time. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, paper. It was very interesting. Um, so I'll open the um, floor for the discussion or either online or in the hall. Does anyone have any comments?